Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we continue the monumental interview on Canadian and international nuclear issues with Dr. Gordon Edwards of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. Part one of this interview ran on Nuclear Hot Seat number 259 from June 7, 2016. Here in part two, Dr. Edward gives a truly international perspective on how the entire nuclear industry can be turned around by cutting it off at the roots, meaning banning uranium mining so the pro nukesters don't have any more raw materials. He also goes into detail on how the First Nations Aboriginal people in multiple countries are leading the way. Plus, our ever cheeky numbnuts of the week and more honest nuclear information than was made available at all the United States 4th of July bombs bursting in air celebrations all over the country. And there was no telling what those bombs might contain, eh? So all of this information is coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, July 5th, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Last week, just as production was winding down on my special about Diablo Canyon nuclear reactors, the California Lands Commission bailed on their responsibility to people and the environment and gave Pacific Gas and Electric, the Diablo Canyon operators, a gold-plated pass on an environmental impact review. Harvey Wasserman, who I interviewed for my show, has a program of his own and did a great post-mortem on it with activists Linda Seeley and Myla Reason. Rather than restate the obvious, we will have a link to Harvey's Solartopia Green Power and Wellness Hour up on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 263. Time for headlines only this week. When is thyroid cancer not thyroid cancer? When doctors reclassify a thyroid tumor. I'm sure it will make all those kids and moms in Fukushima who have nodules feel ever so much better. Propaganda piece ran in the New York Times. We'll link to it on the website. Duck <coughs> and cover. Nuclear reactor accidents and problems this week at Farley in Alabama, Pilgrim in Massachusetts, Grand Gulf in Mississippi, Brunswick in North Carolina, Dwayne Arnold in Iowa, Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, and Salem in New Jersey. <coughs> Over to Japan, where on June 17, a Japanese court kept its ban on operation of two nuclear reactors at the Takahama power plant in Fukui Prefecture by rejecting the plant operator's request to suspend an injunction it had issued over the reactivated reactors. The court said it, quote, cannot conclude that the reactors are safe merely because they have met new regulatory standards on nuclear power plants. But only three days later, Japan's nuclear regulator approved an additional 20 years of operation for the two aging reactors at the Takahama nuclear plant in Fukui Prefecture. Any bets on which side wins? On Friday, June 24th, Shikoku Electric Power Company started loading nuclear fuel into a reactor at its Ikata power plant, aiming at a scheduled restart next month. FMA Governor Tokahiro Nakamura said that because the plant is situated near a fault zone, he hopes the reactor operator will make safety a high priority. Yes, please. Pretty please. Would you please make safety a priority with the nuclear reactor? And now... Nuclear hot seed. Nuclear hot seed. Nuclear hot seed. None that's out of week. On Tuesday, June 28th, the Chiba Municipal Government filed for Environmental Ministry approval to lift the radioactive designation for waste stored in the city that was contaminated by the Fukushima reactor meltdowns over five years ago. These are the big green trash bags that have already broken open, the contents blown around and dispersed widely into the environment. 
The request was made after the city found that levels of radioactive materials in the designated waste are lower than the national designation standards of over 8,000 becquerels per kilogram. But no word of what was tested, from where it was taken, how it was tested, how much of it was tested. We just have to take the government's assurances. This applies to 7.7 tons of designated waste in Chiba that is currently stored at a waste disposal center. The lifting of the designation will allow the city to dispose of the waste the same way as general waste. You know, dump it, spew it, use it in building materials to create roads and schools and other buildings where people live. Hey, you know, by the time it starts killing people, no one will be able to figure out where it came from, so the guys doing this will get off the hook. And that is why, Chiba Municipal Government, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. Here's this week's featured interview. Dr. Gordon Edwards is president of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility and one of Canada's best-known independent experts on nuclear technology. Since 1977, he has worked with the Canadian government, First Nations tribal councils, consulted with governmental and non-governmental bodies, and spoken internationally at conferences sponsored by Physicians for Global Survival and International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, among many others. Part one of our monumental interview posted on Nuclear Hot Seat number 259 on June 7, 2016. Today, in part two... Dr. Edwards continues the saga of how Canada has provided mined uranium to the world, how it figured prominently, if not predominantly, in the development of India's nuclear bomb, and the steps being taken to institute an international ban on uranium mining. To move this ahead, Canada has had two nuclear accidents at the Chalk River Nuclear Laboratories in Ontario. In 1952, right. the reactor and reactor building were seriously damaged by hydrogen explosions, and some 4,500 tons of radioactive water was dumped in ditches about one mile away from the border of the Ottawa River. Then in 1958, fuel rods overheated, and when a robotic crane tried to pull the rods out, these were rods filled with uranium and tried to pull it out of the reactor vessel. The uranium caught fire, the rod broke, and fell down into the containment vessel. So the whole building was contaminated. What is the circumstance at Chalk River now? Chalk River is a real mess. In fact, I wrote an essay a couple of years ago, part of a critique of an environmental impact statement. It was for the renewal license for the Chalk River facilities, which I called it a nuclear sacrifice area because it's got an enormous amount of contamination of different kinds in that Port Hope area. For example, the 1952 accident that you referred to, that was the NRX reactor. It's only a small reactor. It was only about 24 megawatts thermal, so it generated no electricity and only 24 megawatts of heat, which is really not a huge reactor. It's a small reactor. And the world's first really serious nuclear accident took place at Chalk River with that reactor. Basically, the reactor suffered a meltdown along with explosions which blew a four-ton gas holder dome into the infrastructure and released a lot of radioactive material. It was sort of like a mini Chernobyl in the sense that you had those explosions, you had the uh, meltdown, but the meltdown did not go right into the ground. They were able to arrest it as they did at Three Mile Island. They were able to arrest it before it went through the foundations of the plant. Nevertheless, they had to bury the core of the reactor on site, and in order to do that, they got a huge flatbed truck, and of course they had to reinforce the cab with lead partitions to protect the drivers, and they had a relay team of drivers who would just run to the cab of the truck and drive the truck for like two minutes and then run out, and somebody else would run in and drive it for two minutes and run out. And in this way, they transported the melted, the partially melted core to some undetermined, I don't know where this site is exactly, but it's within the confines of the Chalk River property, and it's buried somewhere on site there. Along the way, there was radioactive material that dripped onto the roadway, so they had to rip up some of the roadway and bury it as well. This was the aftermath of that particular accident. The contamination that was off-site was never properly documented, by the way, there were about 600 military men, including 
a lot of naval officers from the American Nuclear Navy under Hyman Rickover. He thought this was a wonderful opportunity for his men to learn how to handle a nuclear emergency. So he sent them up there, and one of those men was Jimmy Carter. So Jimmy Carter was one of the people who came up at Chalk River to help clean up, so-called clean up the mess after that accident. The 1957 accident was not quite as dramatic, as you said, the broken uranium fuel rod, which was actually metallic. Like nowadays, they use pellets. They use ceramic pellets that are in tubes, you know, uh, for the uh, fuel assemblies, for the uh, electricity generating reactors. But these research reactors used metallic fuel. There were metallic plates made of, of uranium metal with aluminum alloy. And so that stuff catches fire quite easily. And when that stuff catches fire, it broke off about a three-foot-long portion, broke off and fell into a maintenance pit, and it spread fission products and transuranic elements like plutonium and americium all throughout the interior of the building. And again, they had about 600 men in that case also involved in the cleanup. And I myself was involved in getting a pension for one of these men uh, who suffered over 200 operations for cancers all over his body, very unusual cancers. But there is no effort on the part of the authorities to follow up the medical histories of these people. There's no interest. We had to go to seven different hearings to get this man, his name was Bjarni Paulson, to get him his compensation for the injuries he suffered and ultimately killed him. And each time they fought tooth and nail to deny. First of all, they denied that he was ever there. Second, they agreed that he was there, but that he never was exposed to radioactivity. The third case, they said, yes, he was exposed to radioactivity, but it was not enough to cause any harm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that I learned from that episode was that the people in the industry have not the slightest interest in knowing what the effects of radioactivity are. They just want to close their eyes to it and deny that it's a problem, because it's not their problem. And that, of course, is the way the industry operates around the world. Uh, That's right. They have a a huge inventory of radioactive waste of all kinds at Chalk River, including a tank. It's called, uh, this is just one, one of many, many different items. If anybody wants to know more about this, they can go to my website, www.ccnr.org, and look in the essays and answers part, and you will find it there about the nuclear sacrifice area. But they have a tank there consisting of 23,000 liters. Each liter is is about the same size as a quart. 23,000 liters of very highly radioactive liquid waste. And it also contains a small quantity of highly enriched uranium. That's the stuff that was used in the Hiroshima bomb. It's directly weapons-usable uranium. It's not like normal uranium that comes out of the ground. It's been highly enriched to over 93%. This material is a witch's brew of radioactive materials of all kinds. It includes cesium-137, iodine-131, krypton-85, all that stuff. Plutonium is in there, too. Americium is in there. And... They now want to ship this 23,000 liters of material in liquid form over public roads about 2,000 kilometers from Chalk River down to the Savannah River site in South Carolina for no particularly good reason other than they say to repatriate the highly enriched uranium because the highly enriched uranium could theoretically be used for bombs and so therefore they want to get it back into the States. But... This means over 100 to 150 shipments over public roads of this highly dangerous liquid, and all of these shipments would be secret because of the fact that it's weapons-usable material, and it would also be accompanied by heavily armed guards with orders to shoot to kill, once again because it's weapons-usable material. All of this is unnecessary because the Chalk River people In 2011, when they got their license, the thing that I wrote my paper for uh, about the nuclear legacy, the nuclear sacrifice area, they had already agreed to solidify this material on site. When you say solidify, you mean through vitrification? Not through vitrification. They have another process called cementation, which is turning it into a kind of a concrete type of solid. Mm -hmm. But this would be much less environmentally threatening to handle because liquid, of course, runs everywhere. If liquid leaks, it just goes everywhere. Whereas solid, 
you at least have the potential with robotic equipment to retrieve it and scoop it up again. The fact that it's weapons usable material could also be handled on site, and this has also been discussed in the past. There's a process called down blending, which is the opposite of enrichment. Instead of making the percentage of uranium-235 higher and higher and higher like you do in an enrichment plant, you make it lower and lower and lower by down blending it. And this can be down blended to the point where it is no longer weapons usable material and therefore poses no security threat from a nuclear weapons point of view. That's what's happening in Indonesia. They have highly enriched uranium leftovers and they are given permission to down blend it. So this is just one example of a general fact that everybody should be aware of. And that general fact is this. Whereas it is true that in North America and Western Europe and hopefully the world, the nuclear power age is winding down, the age of nuclear waste is just beginning. And we have to be more vigilant than ever in terms of keeping an eye on what's happening with this waste material and what they're doing with it and to allow them to just do what they want with it, to allow them to just sort of put it into the marketplace or dump it into landfills or dump it into water bodies or transport it over public roads without any real good reason for that is criminal. And people should be aware of this and they should be alert because only if the public is aroused and aware can this be prevented. And the industry and the governments that supported those industries have to be held to account to really look after this stuff on site. Unfortunately, nobody knows how to neutralize radioactivity. We don't know how to turn it off. That's the problem. We don't know how to turn off radioactivity. It's a form of nuclear energy which cannot be shut off. And that's what caused the meltdown at Chernobyl. That's what caused the meltdown at Fukushima. It wasn't the reactors that melted down. It's the nuclear waste inside the reactors that melted down. And the reason the nuclear waste melts down is because you can't shut off the radioactivity. There's no way to shut it off. And that radioactivity generates enough heat to drive the temperature higher and higher and higher and higher until when it gets to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, it melts. Now that we're talking about nuclear waste, certainly for most Americans, the most blatant Canadian nuclear issue, which is taking place on the shores of Lake Huron, which is that Ontario Power Generation, OPG, has proposed siting a high-level nuclear waste dump within one mile of the shores of Lake Huron and thus the entire Great Lakes. Given that this is the largest freshwater body in the world and provides drinking water to over 40 million people, it really boggles the mind that this is even being contemplated, let alone has gotten so close to a green light from the Canadian government. And even though when Prime Minister Harper lost the latest election to Justin Trudeau, we all expected that Trudeau would come riding up on a white horse and pull the plug on this, that has not quite happen. Can you give us a readout on what the current politics are around this? Well, yes, there you put your finger, of course, on this big, big, big problem, and that is the age of nuclear waste is upon us. If you think about this industry coming to an end, which it seems to be doing, you know, the reactors are slowly shutting down one by one, winking out, as you might say. We've got fewer reactors today in Canada than we had 10 years ago, You've got fewer reactors in the United States than you had 10 years ago because they're shutting down the old ones and they're not really building many new ones. And even if they did build new ones, they couldn't build them as fast as they shut down the old ones. That's true even worldwide. So that's why even people who are pro-nuclear are saying that nuclear power can't possibly make a significant difference at least for the next two or three decades. Even if you built a lot of new reactors, they would not be enough to overwhelm those reactors that have to be shut down. Now, the question becomes then, what do we do with all this radioactive waste, which we never told people about in the first place? We always told people that nuclear power was clean, safe, cheap, and abundant, and people thought, oh, clean, well, nice, wow, no waste. Well, no, that isn't what they meant, it turns out. <laughs> they didn't meant it that there was no waste. They just didn't want you to know that there was the most dangerous industrial waste ever produced by any industry on Earth. 
But they said, well, we're not dispersing it at the moment into the environment. We're not letting it get into the water, into the air, into people's bodies, and therefore it's clean. But this waste remains dangerous for literally millions of years. Ten million years is not enough. Here in Canada, we've done some calculations uh, by authoritative bodies, which are quite mind-boggling. For example, just to give you an idea, if you take one year's production of nuclear waste from one nuclear reactor in Canada, a Canadian can-do reactor, just one year's production of nuclear waste, and ask yourself, how much water would you need to dilute that stuff down to the so-called permissible drinking water levels, you know, the, the levels that are considered permissible for uh, drinking water by the authorities, mm -hmm. which I would not consider permissible, by the way. Neither would I. But nevertheless, that's what they have legally prescribed as the maximum degree of pollution that's allowed. Well, the amount of water you'd need for just one year's worth of one candor reactor is approximately equal to the volume of Lake Superior. That's just one year of one reactor. Now, we have about, in Ontario, there are about 20 reactors, and they operate for about, let's say, 20 or 30 years. So multiply that by 400, 20 times 20, and you have 400 Lake Superiors. Well, nobody has 400 Lake Superiors. You know, it's just ridiculous. So what's the story here? The story is that this industry and the governments that support this industry have allowed this waste to be created without the knowledge of the people who were having to deal with the, the results. And now they want to get rid of it. They want to get rid of it for two reasons. In the case of the industry, they want to limit their liability so that they can draw a line and say, okay, beyond this point in time, we are no longer liable. We are no longer responsible you can't sue us because it's not our problem anymore. It's your problem. And the government similarly wants to limit its regulatory role and say, well, look, we don't have to continue to monitor this and continue to look after it, continue to spend money if we can just somehow get rid of it, say a scientific Hail Mary and walk away. And so that's what the whole impetus is for this idea of abandonment of nuclear waste. And we have come to the conclusion within our organization, the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, that this is a fundamentally irresponsible attitude, that we have no right to abandon this waste. It has to be perpetually monitored. It has to be perpetually looked after for our own benefit. And that means that ultimately the responsibility for this is a public responsibility. It does have to be transferred to the public domain away from the private domain, because these private corporations, they go out of business, they, they go bankrupt, they're nowhere to be found. So it has to be a collective responsibility to look after it, just for our own sake, not because we like the stuff. But in the meantime, we should stop making more of it, you know? I mean, if the proposition had been presented to people fairly in the first place, they would have said, well, that's a crazy technology, let's not do it at all. And so we've got ourselves into this mess because we were lied to. Now, what they're trying to do on the shores of Lake Huron is they have, in fact, a large, the largest nuclear complex in North America is situated right there beside Lake Huron. It's called the Bruce Nuclear Center. There are nine nuclear reactors there, eight of them operating, one of them shut down permanently. There's also an awful lot of nuclear waste, not only the nuclear waste from those eight reactors, but also nuclear waste which has been collected from the other 12 reactors in Ontario that have been transported over public roads up to this area beside Lake Huron for temporary storage. Because they're now realizing that they don't have any long-term capability of planning to look after this stuff in perpetuity, they want to bury it. And, of course, their argument, one of their arguments is, well, isn't it safer to be underground than above ground, you know? Well, that's not really the argument, because what their real purpose is, is not so much to bury it for safety's sake, but to abandon it for the corporation's sake. What they want to do, and, in fact, they say right in their environmental impact statement that the operation has four phases. There's the preparation, which involves the digging up these, uh, this underground repository, excavating, Second is emplacing the waste and packaging and putting the waste all down there. This is not the high-level waste, however. This is all the other waste, all the low-level and intermediate-level waste, they call it. It's not the high-level waste, which is the irradiated nuclear fuel. 
Nevertheless, it's very dangerous material, and there's an awful lot of it. Then they have something called closure, which means that they seal it all up again, do the zipper up, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then the fourth phase is abandonment. And that's what the bottom line is. The only justification for this project is abandonment. If they can actually walk away from it, then it's worth their while to spend the money to do it. But if they had to continue to look after it in perpetuity, then why bother going to such an expense? So this is the real challenge that's going on right now, is that people have to wake up to the idea that the industry and government concept of abandonment is foolish and irresponsible and should not be countenanced. At one time, it might have been thought of as a good idea, but now we know better. For example, in the United States of America, they have tried eight different times to find a geological disposal site for high-level radioactive waste, and they have failed all eight times, the most recent being the Yucca Mountain site. The first one was an underground salt mine in Lyons, Kansas, and that turned out to be a fiasco. And they've had one fiasco after another. The only operating nuclear waste repository in North America today is the one in Carlsbad, New Mexico, which is for uh, low and intermediate level and transuranic contaminated waste from uh, the weapons program. That's the website which I've been covering steadily on nuclear hot seat. Precisely. And the website, they had that accident whereby a barrel turned into a flamethrower and plutonium dust was sent 470 kilometers, I can't remember the exact distance, up to the surface, contaminated 22 workers, drifted downwind, contaminated the town of Carlsbad. This just shows you that they don't know what they're talking about, that they're giving assurances that are not scientifically valid and which are also unethical. Now, in Germany, they had two waste sites for low-level and intermediate-level waste, both of which are catastrophes. One of them is the Assa mine, the Assa II mine. The German government is now taking up waste that was stored down there over the last many decades. They're trying to extract it all, and it's very difficult. It's very costly They're bringing it back up to the surface because the whole waste site is collapsing and has been leaking for more than 10 years. And for 10 years or more, the nuclear engineers who were looking after this waste site did not tell the government that it was leaking because they thought it would be bad PR. Which brings another question to mind, and that is that who do you trust? If you're going to trust the nuclear industry or the nuclear regulatory authority to safeguard this operation, you have another thing coming because these guys have a vested interest in maintaining a good public relations outlook, and therefore they don't want to tell you when things are going catastrophically wrong. The other one is a Morsleben, which is collapsing and in which they're also facing similar problems there. Both of these underground waste repositories have turned out to be fiascos. So when you look at the scientific evidence, you say we don't have a single success story to point to. Why should we continue to believe on faith, like cross my heart and hope to die, say a Hail Mary? Why should we believe on faith that abandonment of nuclear waste underground is in any sense a safe thing to do? It's not scientifically provable, even in principle. So I think that we have to face up to what my organization is proposing is an alternative perspective which was originally pioneered by the National Academy of Sciences in relation to other non-destructible chemical toxins, persistent toxins. It's called rolling stewardship. And rolling stewardship means that you have to actually have a commitment to Each generation has got to do its share towards looking after these wastes. And the point is it can be done. We know how to package the stuff. We know how to monitor it. And we know how to make corrections if things start going bad. We know how we can move in and correct the situation. But we can only do that if the planning and intent is there ahead of time. And also there has to be full information available. There can't be anything under the table or anything hidden. So we're proposing this concept of rolling stewardship until such time as the human uh, mentality (laughs) might possibly devise a truly safe method of disposing of this stuff, but we don't have that method now. But getting back to Lake Huron, there has been tremendous opposition expressed to the idea of less than a mile from Lake Huron in limestone digging this underground repository and putting all 
of the nuclear waste from all of the Ontario reactors, all 22 of them, down into this underground repository and then sealing it up and walking away from it and abandoning it. Now, it's bad enough that it's there in the first place. And it's true, it is there right now, but it is being at least monitored and it's accessible to people who have the necessary tools and expertise and knowledge to take corrective measures. And the public can even help monitor it and, and point out what's going on. If you bury it in abandonment, the problem is two things happen. One of them is amnesia sets in. Nobody anymore even knows what's there because it becomes a case of amnesia. And secondly, when it does start leaking, as I'm sure it will eventually, it's going to be too late to do anything about it because by that time it's too late to dig it all up again. It's already leaking. It's already into the fissures and into the cracks and into the water and into the ecosystem. So these are reasons why one should not accept these premises that we know what to do with this waste. We do not know what to do with this waste, except to look after it. What we do know is we know that we can safely package it, we know that we can monitor it, and we know given the necessary resources, we can look after it so that it doesn't hurt people or the environment. We'll hear more from Dr. Edwards in just a moment. But first, you know, all that coffee I am not drinking is really good for nuclear hot seats health. I'm referring, of course, to what I like to call the Starbucks donation. Sending a donation to Nuclear Hot Seat and the amount of what you'd spend normally on a cup of coffee plus a tip, $5. It's like buying me a cup of coffee I will never drink, but will apply to the monthly running costs of Nuclear Hot Seat. Some of you may even choose to buy me more than one cup, and some of you may make it a monthly recurring Starbucks donation. So if you'd like to help out with a donation of any size, go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and follow the prompts. You can donate by credit card without using PayPal, and if you prefer to sidestep our electronica and wish to send a check, you can email me at info at NuclearHotSeat.com, and by return email, you'll know where to send it. Know that whatever you can do to help, it's necessary, it's appreciated, and as always, I am deeply grateful for your support. Now back to the third and concluding portion of the Nuclear Hot Seat interview with Dr. Gordon Edwards. I do have a few questions that came through from Nuclear Hot Seat listeners who wanted specific issues addressed. Two provinces, British Columbia and Nova Scotia, have already banned uranium mining completely. And in, right. and in Quebec, the provincial government is considering that step, or at least extending the existing temporary moratorium indefinitely, which makes it sound like they want to make it permanent with the option of rescinding it in the future. Can you shed any light on the current situation in Quebec? Yeah, well, this is a good example of where you really see nuclear politics at work, <laughs> because I have to tell you that there was a tremendous outcry, a public outcry, and maybe I should back up a little bit and just mention to you that although Canada is one of the world's largest producers and exporters of uranium and always has been, most of this was done before anybody in the public was allowed to participate in the decision-making in any way or was given any adequate information about the dangers associated with it. So it wasn't until approximately 1970 that the very first public hearing started being held about uranium mining in Canada. And from that time to this, there have been two provinces which have completely banned uranium mining altogether, British Columbia and Nova Scotia, as you said. And Quebec is poised to follow suit if the government can be convinced that the critics have it right. So you could say that once public involvement became a force in decision-making, there has been no more new uranium mining territories opened up. So all the uranium mining is taking place in northern Saskatchewan, and we are hoping that we can work towards getting that shut down. So here's the thing. If we just step back a minute and think about uranium, many people perhaps don't know that uranium really only has two significant uses. One of them is atomic bombs, and it can either be used directly in atomic bombs by using highly enriched uranium, or it can be used in a nuclear reactor as fuel. That's the only other real significant use. 
But every time you use uranium as a fuel, you produce a byproduct called plutonium, which can also be used to make atomic bombs. So no matter how you do it, whether you use it directly for military purposes or indirectly for peaceful purposes, you still end up with a proliferation problem of proliferating the materials necessary for building nuclear bombs and therefore rendering our planet uninhabitable. For example, we have direct experience with this in Canada because we gave a nuclear reactor, when I say we, our government, of course, gave a nuclear reactor to India free of charge, which was a copy of the NRX reactor. The NRX reactor is that one that underwent the meltdown in 1952. And as I mentioned to you earlier in this interview, that reactor was the world's best plutonium-producing reactor. It had the highest neutron flux for many years of any reactor in the world. When we were using that reactor in Chalk River, we were producing plutonium and selling it to the Americans for bombs as a way of financing our peaceful research into nuclear power. And we were also sending some of that plutonium to Britain to help them with their nuclear weapons program, although not explicitly. It was not stated at any time that we were using it to help their nuclear weapons program, but that's in fact what we did. We sent plutonium from Chalk River to Britain in the same calendar year that Britain exploded its first nuclear weapon in the Montebello Islands off of Australia. And in fact, all of the pilot plant work that was done for the Sellafield Plutonium Reprocessing Plant in Britain, but it was then called Windscale, all of the research, all of the pilot plant work for that was done directly at Chalk River. They did the research at Chalk River. We built a plutonium reprocessing plant at Chalk River for that purpose. Then we turn around, and out of the goodness of our hearts, we give a civilian peaceful nuclear reactor to India to help catapult them into the modern age. India turned around and did exactly what we did with that stuff. They used it to make plutonium, and then they used that plutonium to make their first atomic bomb, which was detonated in 1974, called Smiling Buddha. Hmm. So the first atomic bomb explosion that India made was from plutonium produced in a gift nuclear reactor given by the Canadian government. It just shows you the connections, you know, and when you realize that this is what you're doing, then you realize that you cannot separate the peaceful atom and the military atom. There's no way you can do this. It's all separated only in people's minds and by pieces of paper. But pieces of paper have no permanence. When regimes change, the pieces of paper are often burnt or torn up, and you've got a new boss in town. So what's happened is that over the years, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, this is an organization of medical doctors around the world, they won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 for educating not only the public but also political leaders around the world about the medical dangers of nuclear war. They said, look, in the case of nuclear war, don't count on us to help you, us doctors, because we'll either be dead or we'll not have any equipment or any hospitals to help you with. We, we, can't, we can't, there's some diseases we can help with. We can't help with this disease. It's going to be uh, game over. So they really highlighted the medical dangers of a nuclear war, and they brought this all about. Now, the physicians have, over the years, realized increasingly that the root cause of all this, if you go to the root cause, it all starts with uranium. And in fact, the only application of uranium that actually needs uranium is nuclear weapons. There's no other application that needs uranium. For example, electricity. We have many ways of producing electricity. You don't need uranium for that. We can do it by wind. We can do it by, you know. <laughs> Hydroelectric, solar, there are so many ways. All kinds of ways. So uranium is not necessary, is not essential for electricity production, nor do we need it for radioisotope production. You can produce radioisotopes by linear accelerators or cyclotrons. In fact, you can produce medical isotopes this way. So uranium really has only one essential use, and that is nuclear weapons, period. So the IPPNW, and I was there when this happened, that was in 2010, they unanimously passed a resolution saying that we call for a ban on uranium mining worldwide, that uranium is too dangerous a material to mine. You should leave it in the ground. Now, this may sound like a very radical move. It certainly is a radical move. Radical literally means go to the roots. It's radical as the radix is the roots. It's Latin for roots. So going to the root of the problem, that you just should stop mining this material as a start. That's not going to solve the problem, but it will allow the problem to eventually be solved. 
1978, right now people are enamored of our current Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Well, his father was Pierre Elliott Trudeau. And Pierre Elliott Trudeau spoke in 1978 at the United Nations General Assembly, and he said that if you want a world without nuclear weapons, you have to choke off the vital oxygen upon which it feeds. And that means you have to stop producing enriched uranium and plutonium. Well, there you are. If you stop producing enriched uranium and plutonium, it doesn't mean you've solved the problem, but it means you can gradually eliminate and reduce the problem to zero. It's similar to abolishing slavery. When the United States went about abolishing slavery, the first step in abolishing slavery has to be to abolish the slave trade. If you abolish the slave trade, then you have half a chance of abolishing slavery. Otherwise, you have no chance. It's the same thing here. And so what we are now calling for is a worldwide ban on uranium. And, of course, we're one of the worst offenders in Canada, but I'm going to Greenland. You're currently a member of Physicians for Global Survival, which is the Canadian chapter of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. I understand that it has selected you to represent its concerns at a uranium symposium that's going to be held in Greenland on June 12th of this year. What are you going to be doing there? I'm there by invitation of the uh, parties that are organizing this conference in Greenland to communicate the dangers of uranium mining, uh, specifically to the people who are doing the mining. But I've dealt with many Inuit people here in Canada as well. They're extremely intelligent people, the Inuit, and they, they love to have a global view. They like to have the whole picture. And so I'm not going to refrain from talking about these larger issues, but in very short, abbreviated form, just to let them know why the physicians have played such a key role in banning uranium in Canada when it has been banned. In British Columbia, for example, back in 1980, the British Columbia Medical Association published a book about 500 pages long called The Health Dangers of Uranium Mining, and it was just dynamite. It was very, very powerful and had an awful lot of information in it about the health hazards of uranium. And this led to a seven-year moratorium that was declared by the British Columbia Premier at that time, which expired, of course, after seven years. And then recently, when there was you know, that big spike in uranium prices a few years ago and a lot of exploration happened mm -hmm. uh, about uranium mining because of the big spike in prices, which was turned out not to be permanent, well, it came back again, and so people in British Columbia once again went to see the government, and again, the doctors played an important role there, and now we have a permanent ban on uranium mining in British Columbia. Similarly, in Nova Scotia, it's the people who really organize themselves to get this thing done. The leadership on these issues comes from the grassroots. It comes from the bottom up. It never comes from the top down. And here in Quebec, it was 23 doctors 23 doctors at a hospital in a town called Setil, Seven Islands, wrote a letter, to an open letter, to the Quebec government saying that if you don't ban uranium mining, we are going to quit our jobs at the hospital and leave this town and possibly leave the province because we do not believe that we can live with uranium mining in this area because of the health impacts. And was this the only hospital in the area? I don't know if it was, to tell you the truth. It might, there might be another hospital. Uh, but I asked Isabel Gengra, who is one of these doctors, and I, I went with her up to Nunavut to talk about uranium mining up there in the northern part of Canada. I asked her, I said, well, these 23 doctors, how many doctors are there in the hospital? She said, about 80. I said, what about the other doctors? Are they sort of of a different mind? She said, no, we're all basically agreed. We're all basically agreed, but they didn't all want to put their name on a public document. But, you know, there's really nobody who has an alternative point of view among the doctors. So the doctors have been a real help, a real mainstay in terms of leading the charge, you know, on this uranium mining issue. And I'm very proud to be representing the Physicians for Global Survival in Greenland. I'll be talking to them about the role that physicians have played, both nationally and internationally, in uh, combating uranium mining and, of course, the ultimate fruit of nuclear weapons. Now, in Quebec here, of course, the real players that were most powerful, more so than the doctors, were the Cree of northern Quebec. That's where the most advanced uranium exploration project was being planned, up in a mountain called Mount Otish, 
which is the geographical center of Quebec and also the hydrological center because rivers flow in all directions from this mountain down to the St. Lawrence and into James Bay and here, there, and everywhere. Right in these sacred mountains, that's where they found this deposit of uranium and they wanted to strip mine it to get it up and uh, sell it on the, on the world market. The Cree were very, very cautious. They spent two years without taking a position one way or the other, but listening to everything that was said and getting their own evidence put together and getting their own intelligence put together. And then they decided, because the Cree nation, they don't have, again, a top-down type of authority. They have a a very consensus-based decision-making. And they just decided, one night, they just decided, we are never going to allow uranium mining in Cree territory. It is totally incompatible with the Cree way of life and the Cree philosophy of life. And they made it clear that they're not opposed to mining per se, but they're opposed to uranium mining. And they said that like asbestos, it should be left in the ground because bringing asbestos to the surface is just unleashing harm for all the people that come in contact with it. And similarly with uranium. They have taken a very strong position, and in fact, the Grand Chief of the Cree is going to be going with me to Greenland in a couple of weeks, and he's a very eloquent man, uh, Matthew Kuncom, and he is going to speak to this issue as well. I was at the uranium conference that took place in Quebec City last year, and I was able to meet him and interview him and heard him speak a number of times, and it was inspiring to hear the position that he took and the clarity with which he expressed it. So it's great that he's going to be going and speaking here again. What are the possible outcomes from this uranium symposium? Well, gosh, it's, you know, one swallow does not a summer make. (laughs) What we have found... And what my belief is, is that people have to be informed in language that makes sense to them about what these dangers are. And the whole subject has to be demystified. And and don't forget, we have a big language barrier here. For example, my material has to be translated into Greenlandic. And Greenlandic is an Inuit kind of language, which is not identical to the Canadian Inuit language in Niktuk, but which is related to it. And in these languages, these aboriginal languages, there often are not words for many of the things we talk about. For example, the nucleus of an atom, is there a word for that? Is there a word for radioactivity? Is there even a word for uranium? You know, So there are linguistic limitations on communication. This is one of the reasons why I use a lot of photographs. And uh, my friend Robert Del Tredici is a wonderful photographer. He's made some great books, like At Work in the Fields of the Bomb, an award-winning book. And his photographs have entered the mainstream of of American culture, almost like Andy Warhol's pictures can be recognized here, there, and everywhere. David, Bob Del Tredici's photos just crop up in everything from medical textbooks to magazine articles and so on, because he's really undertaken the task of trying to make the invisible visible Mm. and trying to help people to see what these things are through his photographs. And, And that helps a great deal together with using simple, non-mystifying language. I believe that once people see clearly what the problems are, they will simply decide who needs it, (laughs) who needs these problems. (laughs) We've got enough problems already. We don't need these. Certainly we'll be dealing with those from the nuclear industry for beyond the ability to wrap one's head around that kind of a time span. After this symposium, Gordon, What is next for you? It just goes on and on like life itself. But in August, for example, there's going to be a world social forum here in Montreal, people coming from all over the place, and there will be a series of workshops on nuclear issues at that time. We did organize in April of last year, just about a year ago, a World Uranium Symposium. What we did is we managed to achieve through public pressure, and this public pressure, I, I... People should understand that this public pressure is not just a small group of lobbyists sort of carrying picket signs and saying, we don't want uranium. It's from medical doctors. It's from the Cree Nation. It's from 400 municipalities, 400 Quebec municipalities who passed resolutions through their town councils opposing nuclear energy and uranium in Quebec. And we got the only nuclear reactor in Quebec shut down also. That's the Jean T2 nuclear reactor. So Quebec has been the first jurisdiction in North America to become 
nuclear free to eliminate nuclear power from its borders. And we're hoping that uranium will be the next step. Now, the government yielded to the pressure of these different sources, and this included nuclear physicists and other types of scientists as well, speaking out about this. So they declared a one-year moratorium, and during that one-year moratorium, there was going to be public hearings, a kind of an environmental impact hearings on the generic question of uranium mining, not a specific uranium mining, but just the generic question, should there be uranium mining in Quebec? And that panel, which is called the BAP panel, gave its report in June of last year. And so for April of that same year, we scheduled this World Uranium Symposium where people came from all over to participate in a three-day event. And out of that World Uranium Symposium came a declaration And that declaration was signed on to by many, many groups attending the conference and many groups subsequently calling for a worldwide ban on uranium mining, picking up the initiative from the IPPNW people again, the international physicians people. I was there for that conference and I was a witness to the signing and it was very moving because it felt that something historic had taken place and that it was the start of a new phase in the process of phasing out all things nuclear. Yeah, I I think there's a convergence happening and sometimes it always seems too slow, but then again, we humans live too fast, perhaps. (laughs) (laughs) So, Gordon, to wrap up this incredibly rich interview, how can we support your work and the work of Physicians for Global Survival? I think most of all, it's just to become involved. These organizations are usually run on a shoestring. Certainly that's true of my organization. We have no resources to speak of in terms of money or anything like that. But we have a website, and anybody who wants to play a role in their own communities or to link up with other groups, I would suggest that people should really join groups in their own area or maybe... uh, If they have physician friends, for example, they could talk to physician friends and ask if they know about this Nobel Prize winning group, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which has expanded its scope, as we know, to include uranium mining and and nuclear power as well. But I think the main thing is to realize that we're all in this together and that we have to have a sense of our common humanity and that this is an issue that transcends all of the normal partisan political issues that one deals with. Is there anything else that you wish to add at this time? I think the only thing I'd like to add is that one of the great fallacies of our time is the illusion that we are helpless and that one person cannot do anything. This is completely false, but it's a stunning kind of uh, hypnotizing, paralyzing kind of illusion. And people have to break through that and realize that it's simply not true. I myself, when I first became involved in this, was extremely filled with self-doubt, a feeling almost of foolishness, sort of saying, what am I doing this for? You know, it seems foolish. I mean, who am I to tell people uh, anything? But the fact of the matter is, I decided to give it a try because my mentor, who was a man now dead, told me, look, he said, you're a scientist. The scientific method is you do an experiment. You see what the results are. You don't prejudge. So if you think that you're helpless, fine. Do an experiment. Try something and see if you're helpless. And the funny thing is that ever since I started trying to do something, things happen. (laughs) (laughs) And it turns out that you're not helpless at all. You just think you are. But as soon as you try and We all have circles of influence, whether it's our own family, whether it's our work environment, whether it's a club we belong to or a community that we're in. We all have our own sphere of influence, and that's where you start. But it's got to start also with your own determination to become a reliable source of information, which means self-education. That if you educate yourself and be honest, scrupulously honest about passing on information that you know is good information, And if you don't know the answer to something, just say, well, I don't know. I'll see if I can find out. It's amazing what you can accomplish. Dr. Gordon Edwards of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. This interview was recorded before Dr. Edwards addressed the conference in Greenland, which has since taken place. To find out what he covered, we have a series of links up on the website 
NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode, number 263. These links include his talk in Greenland, the PowerPoint he used, and two Danish interviews. They're in English, by the way. One is on the medical aspects of uranium mining, and the other on remediation of a uranium mining site in Saskatchewan. Activist shout-out! Japan's upper house elections are coming up on July 10. It is seen as a last chance to keep Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby's Liberal Democratic Party and its cronies from gaining a complete chokehold over the government. If they win enough seats, Japan's peace constitution will be completely eviscerated. The march towards restarting all of the nuclear reactors that are currently shut down will proceed at a faster clip. And people who will be forced to return to the radioactive areas in Fukushima will be in an even more hopeless situation. In Nuclear Hot Seat's Voices from Japan, episode number 149, from April 22, 2014, we interviewed Taro Yamamoto, an Upper House member and former actor who has always been looking out for the well-being of Fukushima's victims, especially children, and who honors the sanctity of the Constitution. Now there is another bright young man who hopes to join Yamamoto in the Upper House. Yohei Miyaki is a musician running in the election on a peace and anti-nuclear platform. He also stresses the importance of helping Fukushima victims and preventing exposure to radiation, and is the only politician in this election who regularly talks about the Hibakusha, Japanese survivors of the atom bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Miyaki is attracting huge crowds with his message. He ran in 2013, but because of some strangeness in Japan's election categories, even though he won a huge portion of the popular vote, he did not gain a seat in the upper house at that time. But Yohei Miyaki is running under a different category this time, and we at Nuclear Hot Seat wish him every success. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, July 5th, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from NewYorkTimes.com, Tri-CityHerald.com, MTExpress.com, JapanTimes.co.jp, Mainichi.jp, Fukushima-Diary.com, and Iori Mochizuki, Forbes.com, Reuters.com, PHYS.org, Antinuclear.net, TheBulletin.org, The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the good guys and gals, the ones wearing white hats, who are in the activist community of Nuclear Hot Seat. They gather on our Facebook site, which you are all invited to visit and like. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewZSentinel.com, and broadcast on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. We're always looking for other stations and networks to connect with, so if you know of any, let us know. If you sign up on the website, you'll receive notice and a link to each week's Nuclear Hot Seat episode. As a bonus, you'll receive a chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond. Loads of laughs in that one. And the full book is available on Amazon. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest accurate nuclear news, so please do what you can this week and every week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heart History Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is now downloaded every month in 112 countries. We who oppose nuclear are not alone, and we are linking all over the world because we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So nobody go back to sleep. Because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.